Welcome to our annual CAPE workshop for the academic year 2020-2021. This is the seventh year that we've been hosting the workshop, but it is the very first time that we are doing it virtually. Of course, the dynamics will be different. We do not have the luxury of sharing the same physical space or experiencing that warmth that comes with face-to-face -face interaction. And I know that students looked forward to a day away from your schools when you could also visit a university that many of you hope to soon attend. So yes, this year's workshop is different. This new online presentation is definitely different. But if you really consider it, these normal circumstances that we are accustomed to are peripheral to the objectives of the workshop, which are to provide assistance to students studying for the examinations. This year's workshop represents our new normal, and maybe the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed us into a direction that was inevitable, and dare I say, possibly even more practical and efficient. In keeping with the restrictions mandated by the COVID-19 pandemic, our presentations have been pre-recorded and have been posted on the History Department's YouTube channel. There are half-hour sessions on topics selected from your syllabus. You can post your questions in the link provided and you can rest assured that your questions will be answered. When we really consider this new scenario, it does provide you with one huge advantage. You can revisit the presentations as many times as you wish. We in the Department of History continue to be very aware of our role as keepers and disseminators of knowledge of the past. And as we have done before, we are and will continue to take all the necessary measures to ensure that we fulfill this responsibility of keeping the discipline of history alive and applicable to the present and the future. Additionally, our penultimate goal is the molding of young and not so young minds towards the creation and fostering of informed, well-grounded and well-rounded adults who can make positive and valid contributions to the development of self, nation and region. Pandemic or whatever other hurdles may come our way, we will not be deterred from achieving both these goals. I must remind you that history is way more than just about writing and passing exams. It provides you with the tools with which and the foundation on which empires have been built. Let us be the architects of our society, taking it into the future on the back of its history. Also, you are now part of our country's history, where for the very first time, we are experiencing a pandemic in such pervasive and almost debilitating manner. You are also part of the UWI's history, since for the very first time, teaching and learning are being done virtually. As has been done throughout our region's history, students must rise to the current challenge and let it not debilitate you or deter you from excelling in your studies. Our online presentations are geared towards assisting you to achieve this excellence. So students, engage our new virtual forum. Visit the presentations as many times as you wish. Post whatever questions you may have. Appreciate the richness and relevance of our history and be inspired to further your study of history in your tertiary level studies, hopefully at the UWI. On that note, let me once again welcome you to our virtual CAPE workshop. This session will be done by Dr. Jillian Matthews. Dr. Jillian Matthews teaches history at the UWI. She is the recipient of the UWI Guardian Life Premium Teaching Award. Four of her publications are Caribbean Slave Revolts, Church of the Nazarene Trinidad and Tobago, Church of the Nazarene in four of the Windward Islands, and Historical Dictionary of Trinidad and Tobago. I am Jillian Matthews of the University of the West Indies Department of History. I am very pleased that you have chosen to join us today. Welcome. The title of this presentation is Leaders in the Struggle for Mexican Independence 1810 to 18.
1921. It will highlight the work of the four major architects of independence in Mexico. And these were Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon, Vicente Guerrero, Agustin de Itabide, and Father Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo. At the end of the presentation, it is hoped that you will be able to identify and analyze the roles of the four major leaders in the movement for independence in Mexico in the period from 1810 to 1829, and that you will be able to explain why the first two attempts to fight for Mexican independence did not succeed. The grandfather of the Mexican independence movement was a Catholic priest. His name was Father Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo. He was radical in his thinking and was insistent that Spanish colonial rule in Mexico, which had begun as early as 1535, should come to an end. His movement for independence took off in 1810 in an area in Mexico known as Bajio. Bajio was known for its fertile soils and its richness in gold and silver. The problem in the area, however, was that most of the workers were paid low wages and they were taxed heavily. Consequently, when Father Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo gave the call to fight against Spanish colonial rule in Mexico, he was able to win the support of many of those workers in Bahio, most of whom were born in Mexico and thus they were called Criolos. And he was particularly supported by the Mestizo population. Father Hidalgo used two major tactics to win support for his revolutionary movement. The first was known as the Grito de Dolores or the Cry of Dolores, which was issued on September the 16th, 1810. It was a call for all mestizos as well as other parishioners, Roman Catholics in Bahio and other parts of Mexico to rebel against Spanish colonial rule. This tactic definitely worked along with his second major tactic, which was an appeal to the symbol of the Virgin Mary, which in Mexico became known as the Virgin of Guadalupe. According to legend, the Virgin Mary had appeared to a group of mestizos in 1532. And consequently, when Hidalgo used this symbol to rally support for his revolutionary movement, many of the Catholics in Mexico, the poor people were more than willing to support him. To a large extent, the war that Hidalgo waged in Mexico for independence was based on race and on class. For on the one hand, he had the support of the poor Catholic mestizos and Creoles, people born in Spain, as opposed to on the other side, the peninsulares, people who were born in Spain, but were largely colonists in Mexico. Consequently, he used race and class to win support for his struggle for Mexican independence. Alas, however, Hidalgo's attempt to gain independence in the period from 1810 to 1811 ended in failure. In 1811, he was captured by the Viceroy of Peru and he was executed. Nevertheless, he is remembered today and celebrated in Mexico because he was the revolutionary who set in motion the 
direction for independence in Mexico. Secondly, he is celebrated because he influenced other patriots to fight to get rid of Spanish colonial rule in Mexico. The second major architect of independence, of the independence movement in Mexico was another Catholic priest. But before we move on to him, this slide captures a picture of Father Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo, who was the first leader and martyr of Mexican independence. The second major leader was Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon. His struggle lasted a little longer than Hidalgo, running from the period 1811 to 1815. He was born in Mexico and consequently he was considered a Creole and his father belonged to the native population or the Mestizo. He was very religious as a, a Catholic priest, but he was also interested in and involved in military and political leadership in Mexico. He joined the independence struggle during the leadership of Hidalgo and eventually rose to the ranks of lieutenant in the revolutionary army led by Hidalgo. So that when Hidalgo was assassinated in 1811, his place as the leader of the revolutionary movement was taken by Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon. He enjoyed several military victories, especially in the southern section of Mexico. One of his major contributions to the independence movement of Mexico had to do with his writings. He became the author of a treatise entitled Sentiments of the Nation. And in this treatise, he set down the importance of equality and justice, as well as the need for economic and social reform in Mexico. This particular document, Sentiments of the Nation, authored by Morelos, became the framework of Mexico's Declaration of Independence and Constitution established in 1821 and 1824, respectively. Sentiments of the nation were not accepted wholesale, but certainly it provided inspiration for what became known as the Declaration of Independence and the Mexican execution. Unfortunately, as was the, with the case with Hidalgo, Morelos was defeated. He was captured, shackled, tried and executed on December 22nd, 1815. Spanish forces were intolerant of any revolutionary who attempted to get rid of Spanish colonial rule in Mexico. This particular slide provides an image, an artist's impression of Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon, one of the major architects of Mexican independence. And on the right side, we have an artist's impression of the, the um, execution of Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon, which took place in 1815. The only person of African heritage involved in the leadership of the movement for independence in Mexico against Spanish colonial rule was Vicente Guerrero. He was not only African, he was also of Mestizo descent, but today he's remembered as um, an Afro-Mexican involved in the leadership of independence in Mexico. He also, like his predecessors in terms of leadership, was involved in the 1810 leadership for independence led by Hidalgo. So he did have a strong and successful military career. Following the execution of Morelos in 1815, Vicente 
Guerrero decided on the strategic adoption of guerrilla tactics to continue the war for independence in Mexico. This was critical and necessary, considering the fact that with the defeat of both Hidalgo and Morelos, men for the revolutionary cause were short and weapons and other kinds of military resources were also quite limited. So instead of exposing his troops to Spanish loyalist might, Vicente Guerrero decided that the best way, the most effective way to engage the Spanish enemy was to use guerrilla tactics. Fight by ambushing, by hiding, and by attacking the Spanish enemy. And it did work. The extent to which Vicente Guerrero was committed to achieving independence in Mexico can be seen from an encounter with his own father who approached him on behalf of the Viceroy of Peru, who was Juan Ruiz de Apodaca to lay down his arms with the promise that he would be given amnesty or pardon for leading the revolutionary struggle, money, as well as his military title intact. Guerrero, because of his patriotism, because of his commitment and his belief in this, the rights of the struggle for independence, bluntly refused and famously declared independence and liberty or death. He was willing to lay down his life for the cause of independence and liberty in Mexico. My homeland comes first before my father. As I previously noted, it's the testimony of his patriotism, his valor, and his dedication to Mexican independence. This slide prevent, presents an image of the only person of African heritage who was crucial in the leadership of Mexican independence, Vicente Guerrero. And it is also important to note that after independence was secured in 1821, Vicente Guerrero went on to become the leader of Mexico in 1829, only for one year. But during that year, he sealed his legacy by bringing an end to slavery. He was the leader in Mexico who abolished slavery and that took place in 1829. The fourth agent leader in the movement for independence in Mexico was one Agustin de Itabide. Interestingly, Agustin de Itabide was a military commander on the side of Spanish colonial troops. He supported the status quo. He had been noted, he had a reputation for um, supporting the military might of Spain in Mexico. However, he was astute enough. Actually, some historians consider him to be an opportunist because he decided that the only way to bring peace and the only way to bring an end to the struggle for independence and to clinch independence was to unite revolutionary forces who were fighting for independence with the conservative forces whom he had under his military command. And this is exactly what Agustin de Itubide, Itubide did in 1821. The instrument that he used and that succeeded in bringing about this alliance between revolutionary forces on the one hand and conservative forces on the other was known as the Iguala Plan. Guerrero, whom I mentioned previously, the African-Mexican who used guerrilla tactics to fight for independence in Mexico, supported the Iguala Plan. And consequently, he acknowledged Agustin de Itubide as the new ruler of Mexico and surrendered control of his guerrilla troops, that's what Vicente Guerrero did, 
to Itabide and Itabide in turn promoted him to the military position of general. So the leader of the country by 1821 became um, Itabide while the person in charge of the armed forces remained as Guerrero. In the Iguala plan, which eventually became the constitution, taking of course some of the clauses enshrined in Hidalgo, sorry, Morello's um, sentiments of a nation, this Iguala plan guaranteed independence, constitutional monarchy, which meant that uh, Mexico would have been an empire, but it would have been ruled by a constitution. So you had a merging of revolutionary aspirations as well as conservative aspirations by bringing together constitutional rule and monarchical rule. It also guaranteed equality for Creoles, that is Mexicans born in Mexico and Peninsulares, that is Spaniards born in Spain, but who were living in Mexico and to whom, whom to a large extent had control over the country. So it was a compromise between revolutionaries, Creoles on the one hand and Peninsulares and former colonists on the other hand. Another guarantee of the plan of Iguala, which was drafted by Agustin de Itabide was the supremacy of the Roman Catholic Church. Other religions were considered subordinate and to a large extent were persecuted during this early 1820 period. And the Roman Catholic Church was recognized as the National Church of Mexico. This plan, which largely represented a compromise, was accepted by both sides, revolutionaries and royalists. As previously mentioned, Agustin de Itabide became the first constitutional emperor of the now newly independent Mexico. So that Mexico gained its independence in 1821. And the person who was immediately responsible, the person who has been credited for clinching, clinching independence was Agustin de it, it However, his rule as leader was not a smooth one. It was marred by political instability. So much so that between 1821 and 1829, three different regimes had control over Mexico. The first was led by Itabide, followed by Guadalupe Victoria, and as I mentioned earlier, Vicente Guerrero in 1829 became the leader of Mexico. This is an image of the Iguala plan, which largely was responsible for the contents of the Mexican constitution when it became independent and became a constitutional monarchy under Itabide in 18. 21. Uh, an image too of Agustin de Itabide, the sole, the only person who served as constitutional emperor of Mexico. This presentation did not focus particularly on all of the factors which were responsible for bringing about independence. Its focus was on the leadership, the first four major leaders of Mexico independence. It's a very interesting topic and there are many sources that you can read to continue your um, exploration of this very important development in Mexican history, Mexico's history. If you are interested in reading more about this, you can consult the list provided in this particular slide on the sources. I do look forward to your questions and your comments on this topic. And thank you for joining.